This morning we are starting a new sermon series that we are calling Can't or Won't Touch This. What is it about? Well, it's about all the things that we think we can't or won't or aren't willing to address in church. Things we don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Things we just want to leave alone. The third rail. Things we just don't want to talk about. Let sleeping dogs lie. Things we want to say, it's like a hot potato and I don't want to be left holding it. I, you take it, you take it. Or one of my favorites, an elephant in the room. Now, there are probably dozens more of phrases like that we could use. Something everybody is aware of, but nobody wants to talk about. Kind of the story of my life in preaching the gospel a lot of times. Things that God says, hey, this is what you need to preach on. And I'm just like, I don't really want to do that. That seems uncomfortable. But we have to do it anyway. Right? We all have things in our lives that God wants to address, and that is why we have His Word. And so as I speak to you today, and as we speak throughout this series on things that we just don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. Understand that it comes from two places. It comes from a place of love from me, and it comes from a place of Scripture, of God's holy word. Now, as I was researching these phrases that we use, elephant in the room, hot coal, don't touch it with a pole, all that stuff, I went down a little sidetrack. I started studying and learning about elephants because I have a little bit of ADD in my life, and I want to be distracted. And so, as I was learning about these elephants, I came across something I thought might be a helpful introduction. This is advice from an elephant. Y'all with me? Make a big first impression. Don't work for peanuts. Be all ears. Know when to put your foot down. And always be ready to charge ahead. Wisdom from an elephant this morning. Who would have thought you'd hear that in church I've never once preached on an elephant in church before. Well, this morning we are going to jump into the Scriptures, though. That's where we really need to get to get to the heart of this series. I want to see if, as we read this Scripture, if you can discover what the things are we don't want to touch in this passage from 2 Corinthians. This letter that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. You can follow along in your Bibles or on your phones or up on the screens this morning. Now we make known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. For I testify they gave according to their means and beyond their means. They did so voluntarily, begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and fellowship of helping the saints. And they did this not just as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and to us by the will of God. Thus we urge Titus that just as he had previously begun this work, so also he should complete this act of kindness for you. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all eagerness, and in the love from us that is in you, make sure that you excel in this act of kindness too. I am not saying this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love by comparison with the eagerness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you, by his poverty, could become rich. Now the story that's taking place here, that Paul is writing to this church in Corinth, this second letter of, to the Corinthian church, and in chapter 8, as we get this little backstory for you, about two years prior to this letter, there had been a great famine in the city of Jerusalem. The very home, the infancy of the early church. And Paul has asked that all of the non-Jewish Gentile churches from around the uh, uh, Mediterranean world, their world, that they would assist these poor Christians in Jerusalem in their time of need. And Paul, being the great leader that he was, believed that it would be important to help, but it would also promote unity within the larger church these non-Jewish churches helping the Jewish folks, it would bring them together in the same hope and faith they shared in Jesus Christ. And Paul is addressing the big elephant in the room, if you will. If you read the book of Corinthians, you'll know that Corinth, the church in Corinth had been part of taking up an offering for helping the church in Jerusalem already through the famine. But for whatever reason, when they get to this point, they had stopped collecting that offering. 
They had stopped supporting that project. And Paul was saying, hey, look at what the Macedonian church is doing. Look what they've done. This church in Macedonia has been incredibly afflicted by poverty of their own and persecution of their own. In spite of that, they have chosen to be incredibly generous toward the church in Jerusalem. Now, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, hey, you need to follow their example. You need to get back to what you were doing because that's what God wants you to do. Now, I want to be clear here this morning and throughout the series that nowhere in Scripture does Paul suggest or condemn folks who are wealthy. In fact, you and I are blessed to be among the most affluent people in the world. Now, you may not feel like that. You may see the bills piling up. You may see the pressure of day-to-day finances and say, I'm not wealthy. But I will remind you of what I've said many times. The average household income, if you have a household income of $32,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of earners in the world. Top 1%. And the Bible is simply saying to all of us that if we have been blessed, and if God has blessed our lives that with, through His grace, then to be a part of God's work and making a difference to the world is what we're here for. And Paul is not suggesting that poverty is some path to righteousness. What makes us rich in God's eyes is not what is in our accounts. It's what's in our hearts, our sacrifice. It's not about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. So the first thing we're going to cover this morning that we don't want to touch is this. Generosity is always a reaction to grace and not a result of guilt. How many of y'all grew up in the Catholic Church? Anybody? Like, the Catholic Church has, has all kinds of problems, but they got guilt on lockdown. They got guilt on lockdown. And, and, and I say that not as a shot, but as a realization that so much of what the church has done for the last two millennia, or last, well, let's say 1,500 years, has been based on guilt. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says our generosity is a reaction to grace. The Macedonians, in the midst of their poverty, their persecution, the grace of God has touched their lives, and they want to be a part of helping other people experience that same grace that they've experienced. And I will tell you this this morning, and Dave and our finance folks might shoot me for saying it, but if God has not given grace to you, if you haven't experienced the grace of God, when, that, when you walk by that plate, don't put anything in it. Because the grace of God, the generosity is a reaction to the grace not a reaction to guilt. We should never give out of guilt. The first motivation to give should never be a write-off on our taxes. The first motivation to give should never be to make sure that everybody else knows that we give. That should never be the motivation for our generosity. It should be driven only by the grace of God. God has graced my life, and because God has graced my life, I want to make a change in the world. Because God has graced me with forgiveness and mercy, I have to make a difference. Not because the world says I do, but because I have to as a means of response. I want other people to discover what I've discovered. That God has graced my life, and I want that for them as well. The Macedonian church had every excuse not to give. They were in affliction, they were in poverty, they were being persecuted. And I'm not going to get into the excuses that you and I make about our generosity. But one of the ones that we struggle with that I hear most often is this. I'm not sure what's going to be left at the end of the month. I'm not sure what I'm going to have left, so therefore I can't be generous. I've got to make sure I have enough left over. And if there's enough left over, I'll give something to the church. I will tell you this, Robin and I learned early in ministry, one of the best decisions we ever made as a couple was to begin to give generously according to our income, a gift to God. That check came off at the very first of the month. As soon as the paycheck came in, the first automatic payment that went out was the offering. And you know what we found? When we got to the end of the month, we were no longer worried about leftovers. When we finished communion here in a little while at the end of the service, even in our little pandemic version of it, when we break the bread, there will be crumbs. God is not interested in our crumbs. God wants first fruits. And when we begin to make that commitment to make God a priority in our lives and we give to God first, there will always be enough left over at the end of the month. It's amazing the way God works. There's always more than enough, and our lives have been blessed beyond any measure that we could comprehend. And we continue to be blessed if we can choose to put God first. And we don't, maybe we don't make a ton of money. Maybe you do. Maybe it doesn't matter how much you make. When we first started giving, Robin and I, we didn't make very much money. We were both working in retail. Don't make a lot of money doing that. 
And I'll tell you this, I'm also not very good at math. I've confessed that to you before. Math is not my strong suit. But I have found one piece of math that I really enjoy. Five plus two. Anyone know what five plus two is? Not in my, not in my math, it's not. Five plus two equals 5,000 with a remainder of 12. That's what Jesus said. In the hands of Jesus, Jesus asked the little boy what he had, and what did he say? Five loaves of bread and two fish. And what did Jesus do with that? He fed 5,000 people, probably more like 15 or 20,000, and had a remainder of 12 baskets left. That's what God has the power to do. God says, bring me what you have. Bring me what you have, pray over it, and just see what I can do with it. See, I believe that God's the desire to give is a gift from God based on the grace of God, and it brings glory to God. That's what generosity is all about. That's the grace of God. Let me give you another thing we don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole out of this scripture. Generosity is not what God wants from you, but what God wants for you. Let me let you in on a little bit of a secret. God doesn't need my money, and God doesn't need your money. God, we, everything on earth is God's. Money is not an issue with God, but God knows it's an issue with us because it gets in the way of our love for God. What we have gets in the way of honoring God and glorifying God. He doesn't need what we have. We need to give what we have. He wants us to experience the gift of generosity, the joy of participation, the joy of being in partnership, the joy of transformation of lives. And that leads me to the next one. Generosity is when we feel our giving. When we feel our giving because we are invested in what God is doing in the world. I love what verse 3 and verse 4 say. For I testify they gave according to their means and beyond their means. They did so voluntarily begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and fellowship of helping the saints. I've been a pastor for a while, and I can tell you that nobody has ever once come and begged to give an offering. Nobody has begged to give. Where I've had to say, no, I know you can't afford this. No, no let me give it. Let me give it. I've never had that conversation. I've had thousands of conversations about why people can't give, but I've never had someone beg to give. Why did the Macedonian church beg Paul to let them give to the church in Jerusalem? Because they wanted to feel that it was a privilege to share in the work of God, to have a stake in the work of God. Years and years ago, there was a fellow who was facing the pressure of tithing. He went to his pastor, and his pastor said, I've, I've done the math on this thing, on this tithing thing, this 10% thing. He said, I, I make, you know, that's a lot of money. I make X amount of money. And I feel like my tithe, that really wouldn't be that much. I don't feel like I could give you that much money. The pastor said, let me pray with you. The pastor put hands on him and said, Father God, I, I pray that you would be with this gentleman and you would be with him. I pray that you would reduce his salary so that he could afford to tithe. John said, no, no, not that, not that. <laughs> right? We have to feel that generosity. The Macedonians felt that generosity. I'm going to bring that song up again. That song, I'm Surrounded. This is how I fight my battles. That was a theme song for the Macedonians. I fight my battles with God surrounding me because God's grace is with me, and I want to make a difference in the world, and I want to help those folks in Jerusalem because they need it more than I do. You know why the Macedonians gave that offering? Because they never forgot what it was like to be poor. If you've ever struggled with poverty in your life, you'll never forget what it feels like to be poor. And you'll also always be able to relate to those who are poor. Now, I'm not saying we all need to go and be poor so that we can know what it's like to help people in poverty. But I will say this. It's the same thing I say to people all the time. Never forget what it felt like before you knew Jesus when you felt like you were lost without hope. Because as long as you remember what it was like to be lost without hope, you can reach people who are lost without hope. Generosity is feeling what God is doing in your life and what God is going to do through that generosity. Another thing that we don't want to touch. Generosity is not an obligation, but an opportunity. Macedonians didn't feel obliged to give. In fact, as we said, Paul tried to talk them out of it. 
because of what the situation they were in, but they saw an opportunity to invest in what was eternal. What are you investing in? Are you investing on things that won't matter five minutes after the end of this world? Or are you investing in eternity? Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't lay up things on earth that will rust and mold and decay and fall apart, but instead lay up treasures in heaven. As I was thinking about this week, I began to sort of do a back of the envelope, just rough calculation, as far as I can recall, of what my wife and I have given to churches in the last 12 years or so. And while it's not a lot of money in a grand scheme of things, It staggered my mind that we have given that much money compared to what we've brought in. And I don't say that to to broadcast it or be proud. I am humbled by that. Because I know that whatever has been given, God has taken it and manifested it and multiplied it tenfold and more. And that excited me. We've poured into people. Even when we were not engaged in church at one point, we were just sort of showing up and sitting in the pews. We poured into people. We poured into ministry. We invested in the kingdom of God. We didn't wait to hear the word from Jesus as, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We didn't wait until we had a lot to be a significant gift. We gave what little bit we had and trusted God to do the rest. Jesus also said in Mark 8, he said it this way, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Ethiopia to help build water filtration systems for folks who lived out in the the country of Ethiopia, out in the the country part of the country. There's a group called Hope Mission. Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries in the world. Folks we're helping with don't really have much concept of money. Everything they do is based on bartering. But they have a little bit here and there. And as we went to this village and we built their water filters for them and we played with the kids and we got to know the folks a little bit, we were getting ready to leave. And they stopped us and said, you can't leave yet. There's two things we have to do. One is an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, which is a very important part of Ethiopian culture. And that was really cool. But the other thing was when we were walking out the door, they handed us a little mini case of those little tiny like airplane Coke cans, those real tiny ones. They handed one to everybody. And the only thing I could think about was, how much did this cost you? Like for us, yeah, go to 7-Eleven and pick up a can of Coke. But for these folks in Ethiopia, that's at least a month's worth of income to give us that Coke. They wanted us to feel their generosity. They wanted us to experience their generosity. And I don't know if I've ever experienced greater generosity than what I saw in that village. You know what the per capita income in Ethiopia is? $850 a year. $850 a year. And the area we were serving in was a much more impoverished area than that. There's this thing called the World Giving Index. Anybody heard of the World Giving Index? World Giving Index measures countries based on three criteria. uh, Giving money to good causes, volunteering to serve, and helping others. The World Giving Index. Ethiopia is ranked 167th in the world in income. You know where they rank on the World Giving Index? Number 15. 15th in the world in the World Giving Index. Now the United States, we're a very generous nation. We have tons of money. We give tons of money. But as I said earlier, God's not interested in a number. God's interested in sacrifice. God wants to know how much you're sacrificing. God looks at that. The U.S. is number five in the world in income. Number five. Can't beat the people in Luxembourg. Can't beat the people in Switzerland. But we're up there. You know where we are in the World Giving Index? Number 19. Number 19. We're below Ethiopia below countries like Kenya. Just like the Macedonian church, the Ethiopian people have a heart to give because they understand what the grace of God has done in their lives. Pope Francis said it this way, we all need to be evangelized by the poor. We need to be evangelized by the poor. Generosity is not an obligation, but an opportunity to invest in the eternal. Next one is this. Generosity is unleashed when we give ourselves fully to the Lord. Block Hall, I would ask you, have you given yourselves fully to the Lord? Listen to what Paul says. And they did this not just as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to who? The Lord, and to us by the will of God. 
Before they gave themselves to Paul, they gave themselves to the Lord. Before you give yourself to Buckhall, give yourself fully to Jesus. Fully. If you've not done that, you'll never experience the blessings and the power and the grace that God wants to bring in your lives. At some point in the next couple of months, we're going to have our first new member class for folks who've been around for a while and folks who've joined us online and who want to join the church. And I will say in this meeting, like I've said in ones at churches all over the place, we're not making Buckholians. Is that the right term? I don't know if that's the right term or not. It was easy at Gainesville to say Gainesvilleians. We're not making Buckhall people. We're making disciples of Jesus Christ who are members of Buckhall Church. Give yourselves fully to the Lord. Experience the fullness of that grace, and then you'll begin to understand what it means to be a generous person. And when you experience that generosity in the grace of God, you'll understand what the song and the choir say. God owns everything. One of the most basic stewardship principles I've ever learned I don't own anything. God owns everything. And that's hard for us to get a grasp on in the United States in 2021. That we don't own anything. But as a pastor, I work. I have an education. I work hard. I want to think I've earned things, that I own things. But you know who gave you the breath to breathe? God. Who gave you the strength to get up this morning? God. God owns everything. Psalm 24 says this, the earth is the Lord's and what? Everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. For He laid the earth's foundations on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. This Bible, the Word of God, declares and Jesus declares that God is the owner of everything. You and I are just overseers. We're not owners, we're overseers. The Ethiopian people, they get that. They understand they are overseers of what God has entrusted to them. Whatever little bit they have, they know they are God's managers. And somehow we make the mistake in the Western world that we are the owners. If you read Matthew 25, you read the account of where Jesus said there were three servants, and the servants are given gifts. Some were large, some were small. And no matter how much we've been given, we're all going to be held accountable to what we've been given as God's servants. One day we will stand before the Lord, and He's going to ask us some questions. I don't know what those questions are going to be. I'd give you a cheat sheet if I had one, but I don't have one. But I imagine one of those questions is going to be, where did it all go? Where did it all go? Where did it go? What did you spend it on? What did you invest it in? What eternal value has been gained? You see, when we think that we are owners, we ask this question, how much of my money will I give to God? How much will I write that check for? How much will I swipe that card for? Whether it's at Buck Hall or wherever you go to church. But overseers ask this question, how much of God's money will I keep? How much of God's money will I keep for myself? Now, the Old Testament rule that many follow is the tithe, 10%. Give that to God first, and then we give more to other causes and other projects. But again, it's not how much of my money am I going to give, how much of God's money am I going to keep for myself. And I believe this to be true. When you and I, when we give, when we, when we see the Macedonians who gave generously, the Macedonians enjoyed what they had more. And that Ethiopian villagers, when they gave us those coke, they enjoyed what little they had even more. And when we give to the Lord what we enjoy so much more, what's left. And I want to encourage you to try out, to try that. Try to give as much as you can and see how much more you enjoy what's left. I have never met a disciple of Jesus Christ who says, you know what, I wish I had given less to the Lord. I've never heard that. I've heard a lot of people say, I wish I had done more. Once we give to God what is first and what is best and don't give God the crumbs, that generosity becomes contagious. It becomes contagious. I know it's a bad word in 2021, but it's a good word for our generosity to be contagious. I'm going to give you this word from the Corinthians passage, verse 7. Paul says this to the church. It would be helpful if I had the scripture. 
But just as you excel in everything, in faith and in speech and in knowledge and in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the genuineness of your love by comparison with the eagerness of others. I went back this week and I looked through our financial giving for the last year or so at Buckhall Church, just out of curiosity. And it's amazing how generous the people of Buckhall are. Now, that's a big elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about generosity in church. But let me tell you, this is a pastor, and we have Pastor Paul preaching to the church in Corinth. Let me tell you this this morning. I was curious, knowing what the average annual income in our zip codes are, And by my best back-of-the-envelope calculations, 64% of our congregation has given $1,000 or more to the work of the Lord at Buckhall in the last year. That's a good number. You realize in most churches, that number is about 25%. But that also means that 36% of our active membership has given less than that to the causes of God at this church. And I would ask you to simply do this. Compare what you are doing to what other folks are doing. You don't need to know who gives what, but understand those numbers. You know where you are. Are you being a generous person? Are you making an impact for the kingdom? There's some great goals, some things we've talked about since I've been here in the last 15 months. Wonderful things we want to do, projects we want to start, things we want to make happen. And I did some more back-of-the-envelope calculations, and I checked them with my wife because my math is not so good. But if every giving unit in this church, every family or individual who gives, gave an additional $15 a week in 2022, $15 a week, not even the cost of two meals at McDonald's or wherever, we'd have more than $60,000 extra for mission and ministry. If that went up to $25 a week, we'd have almost $100,000 more to change and transform our communities in the world next year. You want to dream about the impact this church can have? in our communities, and in our world. Think about the transformational lives that we could do with $100,000 a year. Think about that over five years. If we only do one-time increase and we stay at that level, in five years, that's half a million dollars for mission and ministry. If we continue to ask ourselves as a congregation to challenge ourselves to where we can be more generous, it wouldn't take much to get to a million dollars for mission and ministry. If we continue to ask God, to pray, God, how can we be a congregation that is so motivated to share the grace that we know of Jesus Christ? It would become contagious and multiplying. I will tell you that's a bold goal, a bodacious goal, to increase our missional giving by half a million dollars in five years. But what God can do with money is unreal. And I would remind you as your pastor that everyone who's a member, if you are a member at this church, You made a vow, and we just reaffirmed that vow at that baptism. To serve God as a priority. Think about that. You made a promise to God. Think about that. I'm going to close with this thought. Generosity is when we become channels and not containers. Channels and not containers. Anybody know the Sea of Galilee? You know, Sea of Galilee, if you read your Bibles, you know, at Israel, right? The Sea of Galilee is an amazing place. One of the most beautiful places in all the Middle East. It's 27 different varieties of fish. An incredibly healthy sea and ecosystem. Beautiful, incredible. The life in the Sea of Galilee is just, it's, it's so full of abundant life. The source of the Sea of Galilee is the River Jordan. It flows into the Sea of Galilee. You know who else, what other place has the, sea of, the River of Jordan as its source? The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea shares the same source as the Sea of Galilee. But the Dead Sea is toxic, it's bitter, it's dying, it's decreasing. What's the difference between the two? The Sea of Galilee has an outlet. It releases the water that it receives. It has a flow. It lets go of what comes in. It passes it on. It lives. The Dead Sea holds on tight, has no outlet. It keeps everything that comes into it. It's become bitter and toxic. I have met a lot of bitter, toxic, stingy people. But I have never, never met a bitter, toxic, generous person. 
The Macedonian people were flowing with life because they were a generous people. They begged Paul to let them give. They begged Paul to let them be a part of it. My last point is this. Generosity always begins and ends with God. Verse 9 of our scripture passage. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you, by his poverty, could become rich. We're going to receive Holy Communion in just a few minutes. Churches all over the world receive communion every Sunday. We will come to this table knowing we represent 1%, the top 1% of wealth in the world, wealthier than 99% of the world. We've been graced, we've been forgiven, we've been blessed. We receive communion with millions and millions of Christ followers that have been graced by Jesus' death and his bloodshed, but who don't have the financial resources we do. As you receive this sacrament, know that Jesus became poor for your sake. When Jesus walked on this earth, he left the splendors of heaven the riches of heaven, to become the Savior, born as a baby in a poor little manger. Didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Had to borrow a coin to do a sermon illustration. Had to borrow a donkey to walk into Jerusalem. Had to have a borrowed tomb to be buried in. Jesus didn't own a single thing. Why? He did it for you and he did it for me. And when you and I experience that grace, when we really fully experience that grace, we can't help be but generous people. We can't help but desire to make an impact in the world because God has impacted us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time together. I thank you that right now as we gather with your disciples all around the world, many of them living on far less than we could even imagine. Help us to remember that they are full of joy because they know your grace has saved their life. That joy has nothing to do with what they hold on to. The joy has to do with what they give. I thank you for this church. I thank you for all the people who are part of this church who have given so wonderfully and so graciously. People who serve graciously people whose lives have been touched by your grace. I pray, Lord, that all of us today, that we would receive that grace. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.